Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, today's lecture is on harmful algal blooms, and it will be a short lecture. I thought we were going to do um, student evaluations today. I didn't realize it doesn't open until after 5 o'clock. So we'll do student evaluations next time, and you'll get a shorter lecture today. My mistake. Um, there won't be any in-class activities today. Um, just a relatively short lecture and a quiz. I got um, most of your current event number three. If you haven't turned that in yet, um, please feel free to turn it in. Um, I, I will still grade it. And um, your final project due date is coming up, so make sure that you are aware of that and that you are working on it. And then finally, I'm not going to grade your current event number three until next week. My main concern this week is getting your exam questions taken care of so you guys have plenty of time to study them. Um, so that's what I'm going to be doing this week. Those should be available by Monday. And then after I'm finished with that, I will work on grading everything to make sure everything's up to date. Okay, so today we're going to cover harmful algal blooms. Um, this is another lecture that has something to do with pollution. In this case, we're going to be talking about nutrient pollution. And um, the specific topics for today are to cover eutrophication harmful algal blooms, human health concerns related to harmful algal blooms, fish kills, and marine mammal strandings. So today our learning goals are to understand that the use of fertilizers on lawns, golf courses, etc., contribute to nutrient accumulation in coastal water bodies, and these fuel phytoplankton blooms. And phytoplankton blooms aren't always a good thing, so harmful algal blooms can form when colonies of phytoplankton grow out of control and produce toxic or harmful effects on people, fish, shellfish, marine mammals, and birds. The blooms, um, the harmful blooms, are responsible for the loss of millions of dollars to the commercial and recreational fisheries and tourist industries. And humans and other animals at higher levels of the marine food web, such as marine mammals, are impacted by HABs or harmful algal blooms through bioaccumulation. So we haven't really done too much um, focusing on individual trophic levels in this class, um, but I think that you did a lot of that in Intro to Oceanography, so this should probably be, um, be a little bit of a review for you. This lecture is mostly about blooms of plankton. Harmful algal blooms are typically blooms of plankton, and plankton are organisms that float near the top of the ocean. Um, they drift with the currents, so they cannot swim against a current. They can move a little bit in some calm water, um, some of them can, but for the most part they're not going to be able to um, decide where they move. Um, they're going to be drifting with the currents and they float from place to place. And they have, if they do have a way to move around, they're very primitive means of mobility. We'll talk about some of those when I show you different types of plankton. And some of these plankton are microscopic organisms called phytoplankton. So pictured here are some phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are, um, they can be bacteria. Some are protists um, and most are single celled plants. And protists are a group of loosely connected, mostly intercellular eukaryotic organisms that aren't plants, animals, or fungi. Um, so they're their own separate group. These organisms are all grouped together as, at the base of the food chain, and they're all similar to each other in that they produce their own food through photosynthesis. So just like land plants, they're producing food through photosynthesis, but here we're talking about single-celled organisms that drift in the ocean currents. So this is the ocean's version of all of the plant life that you would find on land. It's, it's just, uh, it takes a quite different form. There are a variety of different types of photoplankton or phytoplankton, and those are depicted here. So you can have cyanobacteria, um, which are actually bacteria, and these are called blue-green algae. So this is what a cyanobacteria um, would look like. Each of these is an individual bacteria, bacterium. You can have diatoms, um, which have a two-part cell wall made of silica. 
And so they have a um, top and bottom half essentially made of silica, and they can take these really beautiful forms. Dinoflagellates have a flagella or a whip-like structure that they use to, to swim. You can have um, single-celled green algae, which are just simple single-celled plants. And coccolithophores are calcareous scale-bearing marine algae. So you can see all of these different scales that they use um, to cover themselves. So at the base of this harmful algal bloom problem is this idea of um, nutrient enrichment, which is a type of coastal pollution. In fact, it's probably the most widespread type of coastal pollution, and it is pollution by nutrients. So eutrophication means nutrient enrichment, and it drives excess primary production, and that's production by phytoplankton and other marine plants. So nutrients are what's causing these plants to grow, and when you have extra nutrients in a system, you get more plant growth. Eutrophication can be either natural or more often than not, it's caused by human impact. Um, so the way that we add nutrients to coastal environments are through generally through fertilizers. We use fertilizers on our lawns, golf courses, agricultural fields. And these contribute to phosphate and nitrate accumulating. Nope, you didn't miss the quiz yet. We're still in pretty much the introduction. Um, we just finished going over a review on phytoplankton. Quizzes at the end of class. Um, so we add fertilizers to our environment and these make their way into the coastal waters and they result in an accumulation of nutrients that plants need to grow. And in some of these environments, such as lakes and coastal environments, phosphate and nitrate can be limiting nutrients, which means the plant growth that we see there is largely dependent on how much phosphate or nitrate is in the water. And that means that the more nitrogen and phosphate added, the more that we get phytoplankton blooms. So there's a direct link between our use of fertilizer and the um, ability or propensity of these phytoplankton to form massive blooms. You can also get um, some macroalgae growing because of excessive nutrients. So you guys, if any of you live near ponds or um, bayous, you've probably seen like stringy filamentous kind of algae or um, uh, pond weeds kind of growing in those areas. So these can be fueled by excess nutrients by eutrophication as well. Not just talking about phytoplankton, but in this class for harmful algal blooms, we're talking about phytoplankton. Even though this type of algae can be gross, it's not um, producing toxins. All right, so you might be saying at this point, okay, Primary production is a good thing, right? So we have phytoplankton and other algae that are photosynthesizing. They're using up carbon dioxide and producing oxygen, just like land plants do. Phytoplankton are serving as food for many marine organisms. These are all really good things. And that's true, but anything in excess can be a problem. So excessive algal blooms are not necessarily always a good thing. They can shade or overgrow other plant life. You can see in this image, this boat passing through an algal bloom. It's like practically so thick that you can cut through it with the boat wake. So all of this is going to be shading anything that exists at the bottom, including coral reefs or seagrasses. When these algal blooms happen, there's so much algae in the water that there aren't enough animals to graze it down. And so that means a lot of these algal um, cells will die, sink and decay and they use up oxygen in the bottom waters. And we'll talk about this next class when we're talking about hypoxia. And then in this class, excessive algal blooms are not necessarily a good thing when they form harmful algal blooms. And so that's what we're going to focus on here. So that leads us to what is a harmful algal bloom. 
I'm going to shorten harmful algal bloom as HAB from here on out. We, we um, scientists usually use acronyms when they're commonly known. And um, in the scientific community, in the coastal community, HAB is one that is often used. So harmful algal blooms or HABs occur when colonies of phytoplankton grow out of control and produce toxic or harmful effects on people, fish, shellfish, marine mammals, and birds. You might wonder why phytoplankton would produce toxin at all. What's the point of this toxin? Well, it has the same, um, same goal or same purpose as toxins in land plants. So we, are, we, all, we do know that there are a lot of plants that are poisonous, right? That's why we don't just go around eating plants that we don't know that are um, safe for, for you know, food purposes. And phytoplankton can produce toxins for the same reasons as our land plants. So anti-grazing toxins which reduce the number of phytoplankton that are eaten by other organisms. Certainly a reason a lot of land plants develop toxins. Antimicrobial, to ward off bacteria that are harmful to the phytoplankton. And competition. So many different species of phytoplankton are competing for a limited number of nutrients. Remember, there's always a limiting nutrient. So they have to figure out a way to be able to gobble up as many nutrients as possible. And toxins can keep other organisms out of the phytoplankton space. And so that means that phytoplankton has a little bit of space um, in which it can accumulate nutrients. So these toxins are good for the phytoplankton and there are quite a few species that produce them. Most blooms are caused by dinoflagellates. So these are our main, um, the organisms that we're mainly concerned with. But some are caused by diatoms and a few are caused by cyanobacteria. We do know a lot of the factors that contribute to HABs, um, but how these factors come together to create a bloom of algae is not really well understood. There's a lot of effort and um, research involved in trying to be able to predict exactly when a bloom is going to form. And we're getting pretty good at it when it comes to a lake environment. So we can, we can um, have pretty good predictions of when we're going to see a hab in a lake. But when we get into the coastal areas, we have a lot more factors. We have the tides, we have the currents. There are a lot more factors. And so it's become really, really difficult to predict when these are going to happen. But there are forecasting tools being developed, especially for lakes, and hopefully we'll get good enough after we do enough research that we can predict when these blooms are going to happen. We do know that HABs tend to be linked to eutrophication, so nutrient enrichment, nutrient pollution. They tend to be linked to favorable wind and water currents. So if there are um, conditions favorable for plankton growth, like the wind and the water currents are favorable, um, we do tend to see blooms. Sometimes they occur when water circulation is sluggish. So when you have stagnant water, sometimes those blooms can start to form and those toxins accumulate. Unusually high water temperatures. Generally, as long as an organism is tolerant to the warmth, high water temperatures speeds everything up, including the growth of phytoplankton, their reproduction, and their toxin production. Um, so you can get HABs form when you have unusually high water temperatures. And then um, associated with extreme weather events, such as hurricanes, floods, and drought. So hurricanes and floods in general tend to produce conditions where the water is being mixed up. And so you actually get a new supply of nutrients typically in these cases. And then drought will um, oftentimes make the water so it is... Um, it is stratified, and so you have a condition where there's a surface, uh, a bit of surface water at the top that is not mixing too much. Um, so you get kind of a stagnant layer of water right at the top. So all of these things can produce conditions that are favorable for plankton growth. You can see some of these are opposites, like favorable wind and water currents versus sluggish water circulation. It really just depends on the species and it depends on the conditions. And this is why it's so difficult for us to be able to predict when these blooms are going to happen. And then we're dealing with multiple species in coastal environments. Usually lakes are only dealing with one major species that blooms. 
In coastal environments, it can be multiple species at a time, which compound impacts. So yeah, you can see how it can get hard. We like to call HABs red tides. So harmful algal blooms have been around for centuries. And one thing that people have noticed even centuries ago is that these blooms tend to discolor the water. Um, in coastal areas, usually the blooms discolor the water to like yellow, orange, pink, brown, or red hues. Um, it just depends on the organism that's blooming, but usually it's some sort of brown or red. And so in the past, all HABs were called red tides, no matter what the water color was. But today we tend to call them harmful algal blooms because it better captures the term of what we're looking at. And also when you get into lake environments, these HABs can be um, greenish in color. So um, yeah, HAB is definitely, harmful algal bloom is definitely the right term for this. But if you hear the word red tide, um, then you know what people are talking about is a harmful algal bloom. And this is not a condition that's just found in the U.S. Here is a picture of a red tide in South China. China, China certainly has a lot of trouble with harmful algal blooms. So let's talk about some of the illnesses that these harmful algal blooms can cause. Some of these can be quite serious, um, including shellfish poisoning. So there are a variety of different types of shellfish poisoning. We have neurotoxic shellfish poisoning, which is caused by a dinoflagellate Karenia brevis. You're going to see this name many times throughout this lecture because Karenia brevis is one of the more interesting HABs in terms of all of the effects that it has. Diuretic shellfish poisoning caused by another dinoflagellate. We don't um, have this illness in the United States, at least not yet. Paralytic shellfish poisoning is a particularly bad form of shellfish poisoning that's life-threatening, and it's also caused by a dinoflagellate. Amnesiac shellfish poison poisoning is caused by a diatom, so it's not all di dinoflagellates. And all of these illnesses are really difficult to distinguish because they have very similar symptoms. And these include diarrhea, numbness, dizziness, and disorientation. And as you can see, some of them lead to paralysis and even death. Some of the symptoms are transitory, where you get them for a little while. Some of them never go away. So it's a really, really serious problem. And humans normally contract these illnesses when they eat shellfish, which are water filter feeders that concentrate the harmful plankton in their digestive tract. I'm not saying don't eat oysters. I'm just saying you should probably have a pretty good idea of where your oysters are coming from. And um, we're in the United States, we're pretty good at shutting down any sort of harvesting of oysters in areas that are experiencing harmful algal blooms. We're real good at tracking them and we're real good at shutting things down when things, be, when things um, get to be a problem. That's why you don't have friends and family that are um, constantly having shellfish poisoning here when they're eating oysters. Sometimes it happens. Um, but it's not that often. And sometimes it's just, it just manifests as, as, um, uh, like a, like a stomach flu or a, uh, food sickness. Right? Yeah. Eating any seafood is, is a risk. Um, it's a risk that I choose to take all the time. <laughs> I love seafood. But yeah, no, it's a serious problem. And especially if you're eating shellfish in an area that's not the United States. Like I said, here we're pretty safe. But if you're somewhere else eating shellfish and you're not quite sure how their, how their um, capacity to predict blooms or respond to blooms is, you might want to just avoid the shellfish. So it's not just eating things that have accumulated toxins that can cause problems. Um, Karenia brevis is back again in the lecture, and I can tell you at high concentrations, these blooms can cause harm because they release their toxins into the atmosphere. And these are known as brevitoxins. Aerosolized brev brevitoxins are linked to respiratory illnesses in humans, and these can cause a real problem for people with asthma. 
and have been known to cause pneumonia in some people. And so you can see here, I know it's so sad. It really is. Um, however, I will say that we are really, really good at predicting when these problems are going to happen, when brevitoxin issues are going to happen, because we're real good at identifying locations where Karenia brevis is blooming and keeping track of the way that the wind is blowing so we can say if people on the beach are going to experience this. If I had time to develop a um, activity for today, I would have showed you the, um, the prediction tool that we have for predicting when brevitoxins are going to be on the beach. So here is a table showing you the number of um, interviewed dredging company workers that were either on the beach or aboard a ship. And the number that reported eye or respiratory symptoms during a red tide algal bloom. And so here are some of the symptoms, coughing, throat irritation, eye irritation, sneezing, sniffling, mucus with cough, or breathing difficulty. And there were um, quite a few out of 10 on the beach that were experiencing these problems, especially coughing, eye irritation, throat irritation, sneezing, and sniffling. Those were the main ones. And then some people who were very um, sensitive were experiencing breathing difficulty. So these were problems that were happening near shore as the winds were pushing um, these toxins up onto shore. You can see the folks aboard the ship offshore weren't experiencing as much as many problems, but they still experienced some. So the reason for these problems are um, brevitoxins are sodium channel blockers. And the side effects of sodium channel blocking um, compounds are they can cause diarrhea, nausea, headache, and dizziness, which is exactly what a brevitoxin causes when you consume it. So those are its symptoms when you have, um, when you have shellfish poisoning from Karenia brevis. Brevitoxins are also histamine activators, and so they cause inflammation and immune response when you breathe them in. And so this is why their aerosol, aerosolized form causes all of these symptoms. These are related to your airways constricting and your immune response to um, that kind of inflammation. So if you go to the beach in Florida in the summer and you have asthma, definitely bring your inhaler. All right, if you thought Karenia brevis was bad, just wait till I tell you about Ciguatera. <laughs> so Ciguatera is a form of fish poisoning that's associated with a dinoflagellate. And its name is right here. I don't expect you to know it, but you know, it's here in case you're a scientific name person, Gambierdiscus toxicus. Um, and Ciguatera is something that um, can cause humans to become ill after they eat fish that have accumulated these algal toxins in their bodies. And that means that ciguatoxins, um, which are the toxins produced by Ciguatera, um, this, by Gambier discus toxicus, they bioaccumulate in tissue. That means the most dangerous fish tissue to consume are the top predators, because remember when we have bioaccumulation, you have um, fewer of the compounds in the lower trophic levels, like the, the Gambier discus toxicus dinoflagellates themselves. And then as um, fish eat those, they have to eat a lot of them to, to gain a, a gram of tissue. And so they're accumulating more and more of those toxins as you move further and further up the food web. So if you're eating something that's a top predator, like a barracuda, um, from an area that is experiencing a ciguatera bloom, you have a pretty good chance of developing some of these symptoms. The initial symptoms include nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, an itchy rash. It's so itchy that people actually tear their skin. Temperature reversal. So that's where you, for instance, would touch an ice cube and it would feel hot to you, or you would touch a hot water and it would feel cold to you. Freaky, right? Sensitivity to light, fatigue, and muscle pain. All really bad things. All really bad. And in some people, these symptoms are chronic in that they don't go away ever. So people have to live their whole life with these symptoms, including chronic fatigue and chronic pain. In fact, it's believed that ciguatera is one of the main reasons for undiagnosed, unattributed chronic fatigue and chronic pain in people. Pretty scary. 
In areas where ciguatera is a really big problem, this is another thing I would have loved to have an activity on today if I didn't um, have poor time planning. In areas where ciguatera is a problem, typically they are tropical areas near the equator. Um, typically they are areas that are um, undeveloped. And so um, they're areas that depend on fishing a lot for tourism and for human consumption. Because they depend on fish so much for human consumption, ciguatera can cause a huge problem because they can't just close down fishing when there's a bloom happening. Otherwise, they won't have any food to eat. Um, so it becomes a huge issue in these areas. And what happens is people end up just um, trying to consume as many of the lower trophic level fish during the times when the blooms are happening and stay away from those top predators. Um, but certainly this, this can cause huge issues for people that are um, not as wealthy and well-off as, for instance, you and I. People who have to eat fish for a living and don't have any choice. Okay, so just like these toxins can cause problems for people, they can also cause problems for fish. Doesn't necessarily go hand in hand. There's some toxins that are more toxic to fish than, for instance, mammals. Some toxins that influence mammals more rather than fish. Um, but our friend Karenia brevis does it all. So on the west coast of Florida, Karenia brevis can result in massive fish kills and closure of shellfish beds due to shellfish poisoning. Most of the HABs that you hear about in the Gulf of Mexico are going to be related to brevitoxin, Karenia brevis. These blooms are responsible for the loss of millions of dollars to the commercial and recreational fisheries and tourist industries. It's so sad to see a giant fish kill of a whole bunch of snapper or a whole bunch of um, sea trout. It's just, just, just devastating to the people that live in these areas. Not all of these fish kills are associated with the toxin themselves. Many of the fish kills result from hypoxic or low oxygen conditions created by the blooms, and we will talk about this in depth next time. But fish can be killed by exposure to the HAB toxins in the water or in prey that are consumed by these fish. And the, these toxins lead to death typically um, because they impact the gill tissue. And so they damage the gill tissue, which are, for instance, uh, they're the fish's respiratory organs. They're having the same impact that they have on us just in, in gill tissue rather than lungs. And they also disrupt neurologic functions, so they cause um, brain damage or um, poor decision making, which can lead to things like ship strikes. Can you imagine being in a local community where you are a you are a um, avid sportsman and you see a whole bunch of fish washing up on the beach and um, you know, this is your livelihood washing up on the beach. And then as a community, you have to clean up all of those dead fish because it just makes your whole community stink. I mean, it's just a really, it's a really devastating thing to have to deal with, especially when it happens pretty much every year. So just as human consumers of seafood, um, contaminated with biotoxins are at risk, Animals at higher levels of the marine food web, like marine mammals, are also impacted by HABs. Exposure to these algal toxins can occur directly through inhalation of the aerosolized compounds, just like in humans, but more often the impacts are occurring because of transfer through the food web. So you see a lot of impacts. This is an, this is an image here that shows you locations um, in Alaska where HAB toxins were detected in stranded and harvested marine mammals. Most of these are strandings, but there are some like otters here that are harvested. And so you can see that a lot of the organisms that appear here are things that are carnivorous, like sea lions, um, otters, but there are also some organisms like baleen whales that are not carnivorous. So these organisms are accumulating these toxins through the direct ingestion of the phytoplankton or the zooplankton that are eating them or through breathing the air if they're feeding in a bloom. 
Note how many of these are seals and sea lions. Just, just a lot of them. Really a lot of them. Um, so, the impacts of HAB toxins to marine mammals include mortality, as well as sublethal effects. So they can really impact the organism's health. Um, I mean, obviously, if they have an upset stomach and a lot of pain, then that's not going to make them very healthy animals. In extreme cases, HABs have been linked to mass strandings or die-offs, and some of these have affected multiple species at a time. So you'll get, for instance, a whale stranding and also a whole bunch of sea lions washing up on shore um, with, with illness associated with brevitoxin. Or not necessarily brevitoxin, but HAB toxins. Okay, so now it's time for um, your quiz. Which of the following toxins bioaccumulate in the food web? More than one answer may be correct. Choose all the correct answers. All right, looks like there's one person that hasn't answered. So if that's you, um, please just let me know that you want me to open it for you at the end of class and I can do that for you. So the correct answers are everything except nitrate. So nitrate is actually not a toxin, it is a nutrient. But ciguatoxin, which you've learned about this in this class, and mercury and dioxin, which are pollutants we learned about in the previous class. These are all examples of compounds that bioaccumulate in the food web. So nice job. All right, so um, today we learned about um, nutrient enrichment. We learned about the formation of harmful algal blooms, about fish kills and their impacts on the economy, and um, about how these HABs can have impacts on human health and on um, marine mammal health. I was going to have you guys do your um, student evaluations today, but they're not open yet. But I do have one favor to ask, and that is um, if you could do, if you've got a little extra time, if you could leave me some sort of review on Rate My Professor. I think I only have one review on there right now. Um, and I think you guys still use that website when you're choosing professors. So if you had a good time in this class or you think I'm a good professor, go write that on there. If you think I'm a crappy professor and you had a terrible time in this class, go write that on there. I just think it would be good for other students to have a good idea of what they'd be getting into when they take my class because I haven't been around that long. So um, word of mouth is a little bit hard to come by for new professors. So if you could do that, I would really appreciate it um, since you got a little extra time today. And uh, we will do student evaluations next time. And I'll also have a separate evaluation that I want you to complete as extra credit for your final exam. So lots of different evaluations, but you know, uh, that's the way things work when a class is new, or it's the way it should work anyway, is when a class is new. All right, that's it. That's all I have for class. Rate my professor if you've got time.